Hi there, welcome to the seventh video in the All Saints Atlanta virtual choir production uh, tutorial. Um, in this video, we are going to be talking about mastering. Uh, mastering, more or less, is, is how you optimize your uh, track for playback across multiple different devices. So if you play on a phone uh, versus in a car versus over a uh, sound system, it should sound fairly consistent uh, between all three. Um, now, some of this is a little um, minute or difficult to hear. Um, so uh, you usually will want to use headphones for sure uh, when you're doing the uh, mastering process. Um, so uh, just be aware of that. The plugin that we use for mastering is uh, Ozone 9. So the way that you do this is once you've got everything panned and uh, assigned to the proper buses, uh, with the bus presets uh, input already. Over here on the stereo out, I'm going to apply um, Ozone 9, and you can find this in audio units, isotope, Ozone 9, and you don't need any of these um, particular modules, you just need the Ozone 9. So select like that. Um, it will open up, uh, might take a minute to load, especially since we're doing a screen recording. It'll open up um, the uh, Ozone plugin, and then this, uh, you can uncheck this if you don't want to see this, uh, but you can save uh, particular presets, and there are some that are built in that are already pretty close to what you want. Uh, in genre-specific mastering, I found that the classical one works pretty well, uh, and I think I updated it to, yeah, I updated it to include another uh, module in there. Um, so you can uh, listen to that, see if that works, but uh, I actually find that the master assistant um, it's pretty great. It usually works better than just about anything else. So um, what you do is you click this very handy dandy master assistant button right here uh, and you can set some uh, different presets modern versus vintage. Uh, I don't really use vintage, I use modern. Uh, we are using a manual uh, loudness and EQ uh, settings. Uh, you could choose reference and then you load in a reference track if you do this and if you have a recording of um, your choir singing in your space you can load in a reference track and it'll match uh, some of the levels to that track. Now if, if your reference track itself hasn't been mastered um, that may not actually be a good thing um, and also if it's a live recording a lot of times mastering isn't really uh, done in the same fashion that we're doing here um, it's, it's a little bit different for live recordings usually. So it just depends on what you're working with. Uh, for a virtual choir, I usually go with manual. Uh, I set the intensity to medium, and we want it to be set for streaming, not a uh, CD uh, quality. Um, so then I click next, and that's going to tell you, waiting for you to play audio. Uh, you want to play usually the loudest part, which I believe is the third verse in here. So I've already set my playhead at the beginning of the third verse and you'll hit spacebar and then it'll start walking through this uh, module chain that it has set up up here. Uh, and it'll tell you what it's doing at each step of the process and you'll notice some pretty drastic changes happening to the audio as it's going through this. perfectly. I thought I was going to have to click back here. If while it's playing it gets to the end of the song, you would want to click back somewhere to continue playing audio uh, as it's going through this process. Uh, but it, it ended up timing out perfectly. Um, so click accept. Now, um, you might notice that the volume changed drastically uh, during this and it actually didn't apply any dynamics because with the process that we're using, uh, the singers are are probably at a fairly consistent volume throughout, whereas a normal choral piece or even a normal hymn, 
that probably wouldn't be the case if you recorded it live. Um, so that's a little bit different. Um, I'm not going to touch the equalizer or the dynamic EQ. It usually gets something pretty great there. Um, and the maximizer is usually where I end up having to make a couple adjustments in here. Uh, but before I do the maximizer, I'm going to do something else that's going to uh, enhance our sound quite a bit. Uh, and it doesn't automatically add this module in the processing chain. I've just found that this helps significantly. Um, so you click on this plus here to add a module. And then you choose the type of module that you want to add. So I'm going to choose an imager. And what this does is it you can change the um, stereo width of your uh, song. And you can also stereo apply the stereoize um, uh, which enables or disables monocompatible decorrelation processing. Don't ask me what that means. Uh, I just know it makes it sound good. So uh, I'm going to hit play and I'm going to increase the bandwidth. Usually I go about 75% of the way up, um, which is just making the stereoization a little bit wider. Uh, and then I'm going to enable the stereoize function and I'm going to drag it way over here, probably to like 15. Again, I have no idea what truly what this is doing in uh, technical terms. I just know that it, uh, it, it helps and it makes it sound uh, a little fuller. So here we go. Now, this is really loud right now because this maximizer has uh, been set up to... to uh, uh, too high of a volume, honestly. If you look over at stereo out while it's playing, it's, it's, it's peaking, in fact. Uh, and actually, this threshold right here, if I pull this up, um, it's going to improve that a little bit, uh, but only to a, a certain degree. So I'm going to hit play. helps a little bit. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to actually decrease the input gain. Notice there's an R and an L here, but they're linked right now. If I undo this, it, I, I can change the amount on each. I don't ever envision a scenario where you would want to do that, but you can do that if, if you needed to at some point. Um, but here we go. Oh, just me hitting the space bar, I guess. Um, I'm pulling it back to try and be at the bottom side of this yellow area right here. Um, so let's listen again. Maybe I need to make another adjustment there. Yeah, we can pull it out down a little bit. Sometimes I also adjust the output gain to and reduce that. A little bit more. That's pretty good. Um, and you'll notice, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, initially the imager was at the end of this chain. Uh, I actually want to apply the imager before the maximizer uh, because it goes through this chain from left to right. Uh, so I want to make that stereo uh, effect more drastic with the imager before I apply the maximizer so that it's going to amplify the stereo, the, the more stereo version, the more uh, wider stereo version of this uh, audio rather than amplifying it then applying the imager. It's just a matter of preference. You can toy with this. There's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, there's just, you know, uh, whatever works for you. Um, I don't ever usually mess with anything else in here, um, but you can, you can kind of sit here and uh, mess with more of these. 
uh, and, and just see what they do and play around with it if you want. Um, and it, it applies this EQ actually here, and this EQ kind of looks the opposite of the additive EQ that I have going on, um, where I give it a, a boost in the middle and cut it on the edges. Um, it's, I believe it's creating an EQ that aligns with that classical preset that we had on here, although I'm not 100% sure of that. But um, either way, we've cut out what we don't want out of these frequency ranges. So now it's okay if it boosts those frequency ranges again to kind of level the output across. Um, you'll notice that the consonants in particular have lots more um, sustain to them. Uh, the sibilants, which are all happening up in this area. Um, and that's what's left in this frequency range, again, is going to be the good stuff. We've already cut the bad stuff out. So it's, it's we cut the bad stuff, and now we're boosting the good stuff that we want. Um, so this EQ curve, while it looks converse to what we would what we have applied earlier on in our uh, processing of this audio, um, this ends up achieving still a pretty desirable, desirable result, I think. Now, uh, we are done with the mastering process. It's very quick and easy. This plugin, Ozone 9, just does all the work for you. It's amazing. Um, saves so much time. I wouldn't even know where to begin without using that plugin. Now, uh, I'm going to go back to the beginning here, and I'm going to listen. There's not a lot of room hiss going on, so we're in good shape there. Okay, you notice right here in this area, there's some pretty... Uh, loud-ish mouth noises going on. Uh, I'm going to actually remove those in Melodyne. So I'm going to hit X, open the mixer back up, click on Melodyne, uh, and then I'm going to select all of the voice parts. Sometimes you'll catch this when you're proofing in Melodyne, sometimes you won't. Uh, let me go to the beginning here. Um, and I'm actually, the quick way to do this is to just drag a box around everybody's stuff here and hit delete and see what we lose. So, um, it looks like we've maybe lost a couple people's S's here, but actually on Celimony's, uh tutorials on their website, uh, they actually suggest deleting some of the consonants and sibilants from uh, tracks that are um, moving uh, in homophony with whatever your solo melody line is. Again, that, that guide is, is more so created for pop music, but um, I mean, the same principles can apply. Uh, if we lose a couple people's S's, as long as there are some left, we will still hear it because that's going to carry over everything else. It's just falling in a frequency range where there's nothing else going on. So uh, now let's listen and see. Okay. Great, in that we've got no more mouth noises. However, now we're missing the breath. So I'm going to undo, put all that back, and you can see if you look really closely visually in here, there's some of these pops are going on right here. I'm actually going to trim, I'm going to select everything here again. I need that breath, otherwise it's going to sound super, super unnatural. So uh, while I have all selected, I'm going to go to the note separation tool, and then I'm going to double click ahead of where this breath is right here anywhere on any of these lines, and it will separate in that spot on all of these. It should. Every so often it doesn't like to work the way that it's supposed to, but we will see. It's thinking because it's got to do this 11 times. There we go. And now you can see straight up and down there's that line right there. I'm going to go back to the main tool. I'm going to select up to where that line was. And now notice I'm not selecting the breath anymore. I can avoid that breath. And I'm going to hit delete. And let's see where we're at. See. So now that'll work. 
um, because I've got the breath in there and I got those pops and mouth noises out of the audio. Let me go back to the main view and let's listen to this transition. I think we may have the organ a little quiet now. Let's go back up a teeny bit. I think that balance on the organ is good, but I actually don't like the uh, where it starts. Let's listen at the beginning again. So the differential in the volume, once the voices come in, is significant right now, and that's not actually what I'm looking for. So I, there are two things, two ways that I could go about this. I can go back into Ozone, uh, and I can put that uh, threshold here a little bit lower. Since I pulled the gain back, I might be able to get away with this. Let's see. different. I actually kind of like this setting a little more. It's closer to what it initially proposed. Um, but here's how we can solve this problem. Um, so I, oh, I'm not sure how this track got scrunched up. It's a little bit smaller than the rest. There we go. Just visually will bug me otherwise. Um, I'm going to enable show the automations. Um, and what this is going to do, everything's going to get a little bit bigger. Uh, don't freak out that it looks a little bit different. All we're going to do is turn on the automation for this backing track. Uh, and I'm going to do that by clicking here. And now this line will be highlighted. So what we can do is we can tell this track to change volume over time based on where we're at in this. And you can apply lots of different effects here. Um, you can automate, you know, basically any effect uh, can be applied to the automation here. Uh, but we're working with volume right now. Excuse me. So I need to create a couple points on this line. I don't want to change the baseline during the uh, verses because that balance we've already established uh, as being right where we want it. So I'm just going to change the intro. So I'm going to isolate the intro. I'm going to add a point where the verse starts, and I'm, I'm going to add a point at the end of the play-in. I'm going to do the same thing at the beginning right here. Notice I already have a point at the very beginning. Uh, and I'm just going to add one more here. So we're not drastically affecting any room noise that's going on here and boosting that too, too much. Now I can keep it level across when I change this volume. If I click the leftmost inner point, right? I'm not clicking this one. I'm clicking this one because I want to change the audio here of the play-in. Hold shift, click that second one. Now I've got both of them selected. It'll stay level while I'm moving it. If I don't do it that way, and I just click one of them, it'll just move that point up and we'll get a crescendo over time. Um, so I, I want to have both of them selected by holding shift and clicking both of them. And then I'm going to pull them up. Probably not going to need a whole lot. Probably about right there. Another, well, maybe another half a decibel. Something like that. And now I think when the voices came in, it was closer to minus 18, so I'm going to give it a little additional boost. Now if you 
listening closely, you'll hear that there's something going on here when I'm boosting the volume here. The room noise, the hiss that is already in this recording, which wasn't super um, challenging to work with before, is now all of a sudden more noticeable, especially since the organ is the only thing going on right here. So um, we need to do something to mitigate that a little bit. And we can do that by, I'm going to set the cycle range to before the organ enters. Uh, we're going to go back to our old friend RX uh, Spectral Denoise. So after Melodyne and the processing chain, I'm going to add some RX-8 Spectral Denoise. It'll probably be in your recent. If it's not, audio units, isotope, RX-8, Spectral Denoise. Um, and now, this is very important. I'm actually going to leave this right where it's at. I'm going to pull the threshold down a little bit. Uh, but the reduction I don't want very high because the organ is the only instrument of its kind sounding. On the singers, we can afford to reduce a little bit more uh, because there's enough singers to where that effect won't, the effect of that won't be noticeable. If I drag it up to 16, though, uh, it's going to significantly impact the uh, sound of the organ as it's playing. Um, so, click learn. I've got the cycler on, so it's going to cycle through the silence here. And now we've isolated the frequency of the room noise. And you'll see right here these, these peaks and then this sub bass going on way down here. This is what we're hearing that's sticking out in the plan. So now if I hit play again, it's reduced. Uh, and I actually might kick it a little bit more. And those lines start to separate when you move that reduction up, meaning that you're pulling this sound down by that much. A little bit better. Let's see what happens when I turn off the cycler. Might pull a little bit more out. Probably about there. That's better. Uh, it, you probably can't get it to be perfect um, in a context like this, but it doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be pretty good. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Okay, now how do we get our audio out of Logic and into uh, at, and and ready for uh, video setup? Uh, I'll show you that in just a moment. Let's. Although I forgot to listen to the end, let's listen to the very end. So, you heard a little bit of noise going on there. It's a good thing we came over here and listened. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Let's find out. I'm going to do that by setting the cycler to after the cutoff. I don't see anybody else's stuff moving. It may be in the organ track. Yep. So he canceled the uh, registration there or something, and uh, that button shift is happening. That's going to be hard to remove. Um, but what a good case study for this uh, example right now. Let's see. How am I going to go about doing this? I think I can I could try another spectral denoise, but I might need to splice that out onto its own track. Let's see. Let's see if I can. Let's see if I can do this. I'm gonna split the track from right at right before that noise happens, and then right after that noise happens. I think I got it in the right spot. Again, I think I got it. Okay, Let's see what happens. Okay, so I hit um, Control M, not Command M, and that mutes that little region of audio there. Uh, but now you'll notice the room noise suddenly goes away and comes back, and that's not what we want. Um, 
Also, we're losing a little bit of the reverb. So I'm actually going to click this and delete it. I'm going to try and pull some of this back. Yeah, that comes pretty quickly. Try. I'm going to drag this back end across, and it's going to automatically implement a cross fade right here, meaning that it fades one out as it fades the other in, so the volume level should be kind of consistent. Ah, there's another little noise going on here, so let me trim that up more. Now you hear right at the end that room noise goes it like shuts off uh, drastically. That's where a fade tool can come in handy. Again, hold command if you have it on your secondary tool. You may have to select it again up here. Command, get as close as you can to the edge, click and drag. Okay, there we go. Let's see how that sounds in context. Not the greatest patch ever uh, because we're losing some of the reverb off of this end right here, some of the room noise there. Uh, not a lot more can be done about that unless I were to apply uh, the um, uh, the uh, presets that I have, but I think that's actually going to make it a little too wet. And again, it's, it's just a really subtle thing at the very end. Uh, most people aren't going to even notice that to begin with, so um, I don't think that's uh, worth griping over. Now that we got that little noise out, I think we are good. So let's get this out of Logic and ready for uh, video setup. Um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out how much lead time I want before the organ comes in. So let me start from the beginning. way too much in its current state. So I'm going to set the cycle range to take some of that off. And then the end of it, though, I'm going to leave a generous amount of extra space past the rightmost edge. So I'm going to hit spacebar, and it's going to play just from that cycle range, so I'll hear exactly how much lead time I've got. Pretty good. Uh, I'm happy with that. Uh, so now let me save. And now I'm going to bounce this out. Bouncing it out means uh, that we're, we're exporting it, basically. It's just the term that they use in Logic. So um, I've got my cycle range on. If I hit Command-B, uh, it will take me to this export screen. Now, you'll want to make sure here that you've got it set to um, PCM and then the file format. Uh, I use WAVE. You could use AIFF if you want. Um, MP3 is going to be compressed too much for, for high quality audio, like the amount of time that we just spent on this, an MP3 is going to be too compressed. So I'm going to choose PCM Wave. Notice that it's set to exactly what my cycle range is. It's going to start at the beginning of the cycle range, it's going to end at the end of the cycle range, and it's going to be exact uh, when you have that cycler on, which is why we set that range there. Um, also, I'm just going to leave resolution 16-bit, 44, 100. Um, you may want to turn on dithering. Uh, that's just going to keep it from having little digital artifacts in there. Um, it'll tell you how much disk space it's going to take up, take up and how long the audio file itself will be, 2 minutes, 29 seconds. Click OK. Now I'm going to select where I want it to export. Um, I don't actually want it to export there. I want it to go in the same folder that I've got. And now if you have um, if you have uh, backup and sync for Google Drive enabled and you're uh, placing it in a folder that's syncing to Google Drive, um, I'm, what I do is I retitle it, title the song, parentheses, master, and I bounce it out like that. Now, while it's bouncing, I'll tell you about this file organization system that I've got set up here. Um, so this folder, this file tree, this set of files um, that uh, I was talking about in the first video, 
um, within, there's this All Saints Virtual Choir Emporium. And then we talked about this 2021 projects folder being within there. I added this to my drive so that the folder itself is actually in my drive, not a shortcut. And when I did that, it automatically downloads using this backup and sync for Google Drive. Um, it downloads everything in that folder to my hard drive. So I don't actually have to download or upload anything. But the nice thing about this is when I bounce it out into one of these folders that's shared to Google Drive, it'll upload it and create a link for this file. So if I navigate to it on Google Drive, um, whenever it is complete and uploaded, see, it's still bouncing right now. So I don't want to mess, in, mess with anything with that file until it's uh, completely done bouncing. But once it uh, bounces and it uploads, I can get a link for this file. And if I bounce it again, as long as I choose the same file name, it will replace the file at that link. So I can actually send this link to Kirk and say, here's the master, go ahead and listen to it, proof it, and if, if you want any changes made, let me know. And then if I need to make adjustments, if I export it to the same file name in the same folder, it will update the link he already has. So he can just go back to that link once I message him to let him know, hey, it's updated, go check it out. And then you don't have to keep resending this link and you don't have to have like um, version 3.1 or version 3.2, 3.4 or uh, export it at 9.52 p.m. and then you have all these files to deal with. You're just dealing with the one master file that gets continually updated in the same place on Google Drive. And you notice it's got the screen check, which means it's synced. So I can open this up on Drive. If I right click, I can select view on Google Drive. It'll take me directly to it in a new tab. And there it is. I can go to share it and the link will always be the same if I bounce it out to that same file name each time. So we don't need to mess with that right now. Um, but that wraps up our uh, mastering and exporting section. The very last video in this tutorial uh, will demonstrate how we set everything up for uh, video recordings. Um, so we look forward to seeing you in the final video.